Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the IMSC Algebraic Combinatoric Seminar. It's a great pleasure to have today uh, Greta Panova from the University of Southern California. She's going to talk about the mysterious Kronecker coefficient. Um, Greta, please begin. Yeah, uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be speaking in India. I wish I will, could go there in person, never been, but <laughs> uh, maybe, well, maybe sometime at, at FIPSAC in the future. Um, so uh, my talk today is very algebraic combinatoric. See, it's uh, maybe more algebraic uh, than combinatorial. We'll, you'll see why in a moment. So um, I, I guess I don't know your the general background, but I see that in algebraic combinatorics, you're there, you had a lot of talks related to representation theory. So I hope you don't mind that this, uh, we will get there with the definition. So this is an overview of the interaction between algebraic combinatorics and other um, and other parts of uh, mathematics, um, most notably, of course, representation theory. So today the connection is going to be really between uh, algebraic combinatorics, which studies discrete structures generating functions and um, other objects which are mostly motivated from representation theory. So let's get to it. And uh, of course, please interrupt me if, uh, if you're not familiar with something that uh, I should explain. Okay, so now I'm going to trust that you have some familiarity with all these things in this picture. So of course, permutations, bijections from the set from one up to n to one up to n or arrangements of these numbers in a, uh, <clears throat> on a line. Uh, integer partitions, which we represent as young diagrams over here. Uh, permutations, when we study them under compositions form the symmetric group. And um, if you study irreducible representations for the symmetric group, these are the Specht modules and they are indexed by integer partitions. So you have all these things are connected here. And uh, then come the more combinatorial objects, the standard Young tableau, which are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the basis for the irreducible SN modules as lambda. And, um, and somewhere there from Schurweil duality, we have, of course, uh, the irreducible GLN modules, which are also indexed by partitions, this time infinitely many. And uh, they can be studied via the semi-standard Young tableau. So this is a very uh, brief overview of what we do or the objects that we study. And now let's get into some details. So uh, once we talk about irreducible representations, we really want to do something with them. And uh, one thing we can do is we can take tensor products of irreducible representations and in the case of GLN, which is a reductive group, we, uh, we can factor them into reducible representations with some multiplicities and the multiplicities would necessarily be non-negative integers. This we call the Littlewood Richardson coefficients, I, which uh, are probably quite famous and I trust you've seen. Um, and um, Something nice about the Littlewood Richardson coefficients is that they do have a combinatorial representation, in, interpretation. Uh, or, in other words, we can say that the Littlewood Richardson coefficients, even though there is no um, there is no closed form formula for them, they uh, they are counting some type of enumerable combinatorial objects. Or in Littlewood Richardson tableau, these are Stand, uh, semi standard young tableau of skew shape mu over mu in this case and type lambda. So, for example, here, if we consider this, uh, the, the Littlewood Richardson coefficient, this one here, which would be 
the multiplicity of the repre irreducible representation corresponding to 643 in the tensor product of 31 and 432. It's going to be two because these combinatorial objects that fit whatever restrictions this rule uh, encompasses, these are going to be just two. And in other words, um, so my talk will touch, touch a little bit on complexity, computational complexity. So um, if you are familiar with this, this is more or less equivalent to saying that uh, to compute the little Wood Richardson coefficients as a problem is in Sharpie. And I will define this later when we get into detail. So just a remark right now. And now let's do the same game with the symmetric group. Let's take the SPECT modules, the reducible representations for the symmetric group, and um, they are representation under the diagonal action of the symmetric group that did factors um, as a, a direct product of irreducible representations, of course, with some multiplicities. And these multiplicities, they are indexed by the three partitions, lambda, mu, and nu are exactly the Kronecker coefficients. I will denote them maybe not so standardly by G lambda mu nu. And um, uh, here, is, here are some examples of this type of decomposition. Uh, one thing that um, we should be aware of is that these uh, coefficients are symmetric. So if we switch tensor products of mu and nu, then S lambda here will show up with the same co uh, multiplicity, or in other words, we can permute lambda mu and nu will get the same coefficient. And uh, this, is, uh, this is because the characters of the symmetry group are real, real numbers and uh, the inner product uh, works nicely in this way. Okay, so what is really the problem? And the problem is very old. I mean, it's getting more than 80 years old at this point. Uh, it's really asking for us to do something like we did with the little Richardson coefficients and uh, figure out some kind of formula for this G lambda mu and nu. So it's not probably not gonna be a closed form formula, but something like the little Richardson coefficient, this would be ideal. And uh, more uh, formally, this would be a family of combinatorial objects such that the coefficient is equal to their enumeration. Uh, but this is not very well defined. So if you want to uh, formalize this a little bit, you may want to actually phrase it in the language of computational complexity and say that a positive combinatorial formula from our intuitive uh, perspective is really just the fact that uh, equivalent to having this problem be in the class sharp P. So things that are um, computable as, as an exponentially large sum over polynomially defined objects. So as I said, I will define this later. Uh, but really, uh, we well, we do have some properties of this Kronecker coefficients, but really they're still a black box. A black box, well, maybe the sides are not entirely black, so we can try to see through a little bit and uh, use it as an input and output with some properties, but uh, we basically don't have that much understanding. And uh, just to illustrate how far from any solution we are here are some results that we have stored a state of the art uh, formulas or combinatorial interpretations for G lambda mu nu when nu is a partition of two rows and some other restrictions, or when nu is a, a hook, uh, which is probably the most general rule that we have because the formula is um, um, has no restrictions on the other two partitions. And uh, various other special cases that, that have shown up uh, 
in work of many researchers, both in combinatorics and representation theory, and also in geometric complexity theory, um, which is another source of motivation why we want to actually study this problem. Um, so, for example, people who study geometric complexity theory, which is aiming, roughly speaking, to separate complexity classes, like solve the algebraic form of P not equal to NP, uh, these coefficients do show up and, uh, and they are, so they are important objects. And uh, people have figured out, in this case, you can Marmo Mule Walter, have this breakthrough result that deciding whether a Kronecker coefficient is positive, just whether it's zero or non-zero, is already a difficult problem, a computationally difficult problem. And uh, immediately, this immediately tells us that we are not going to have a nice, very easy combinatorial interpretation, or in other words, it's a sharp P hard problem. Um, and, uh, and some other cases which, which were related to geometric complexity theory and it's, um, you know, are applicable, for example, that the Kronecker coefficients of two rectangles with adding some long first row and uh, any, any other partitions, for example, this is positive. This is another type of result that we could get, again, very, very special cases. And uh, and so everything basically from here on is open problems. So what I'm going to talk about now is um, various perspectives on look at looking at this coefficient so that we can maybe infer something about them despite not the lack of any formulas. Um, can I ask you whether the coefficients, yes. uh, Kronecker coefficients and little root Richardson coefficients are related? Yes, they are related and I skipped this part from the slide, but little root Richardson are a special case of Kronecker coefficients. So um, basically, if you take a, li a little root Richardson coefficient, which is indexed by three partitions, say lambda mu and nu, then it is equal to the Kronecker coefficient where we take this three partition lambda mu and nu and we add on top a long first row so that the sizes become equal. Uh, so this is, and this is a little Wood Richardson coefficient. So it's really a special case of the Kronecker, which is yet another source of intuition or hope. And, you know, uh, every, so another reason why we want to we are hoping to see some similar behavior, but so far the evidence is counter to that. Um, okay, so- I had a question. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, what is known about the positivity of little wood richardson coefficient? Ah, uh, um, so positivity, deciding the positivity of little wood richardson coefficients is a polynomial problem and it's, it's equivalent to deciding whether and the polytope is empty or not. Um, I, I may mention this uh, a little bit later, but this is a very special special phenomenon with little Wood Richardson coefficient. And it comes from the Knudsen Tau theorem and solution for the saturation conjecture, basically. Um, Little Wood Richardson coefficients count points in a very nice polytope, and having one integer point is equivalent to the polytope non being non-empty, which is now a linear programming problem to decide whether whether this is a there is a, a point in this polytope. <clears throat> so Basically, little Wood Richardson coefficients are much nicer than Kronecker, and hopefully, we'll be able to prove this uh, rigorously sometime uh, in the near future. Okay, um, so let's let's do a warm up, something very easy, <laughs> or 
or seemingly easy, just so that we get a feel for what these coefficients uh, look like and how they behave. Okay, so here is a very standard st standard problem that you would teach in your enumerative combinatorics course, how to count integer partitions and generating functions. This goes back to Ramanujan, for example. So a um, very classical area. So we have Pn, the number of uh, per integer partitions, and then in Pn Lm, which is the number of integer partitions which fit inside the rectangle. Okay, so we have sides L and M, and we just look at integer partitions whose Young diagram is inside here. And the generating function for this, of course, it's a polynomial, it's the Q, uh, Q analog of the binomial coefficients or Q binomial coefficients. Now, um, of course, for the so we we know a lot of things about just p n without any restrictions. We have an exponential uh, asymptotic formula, and of course, trivially, we have that these numbers are strictly increasing. You can prove this combinatorially immediately. But what happens? If we consider the numbers P, N, L, M, well, they actually form a unimodal sequence. So they are first increasing and then they start decreasing again, because as you can imagine, here we have one on one end and P, L, M is going to be just one partition, the entire rectangle. So, so uh, and uh, the symmetry and actually this this sequence is symmetric around the center, which is we can see combinatorially. Um, and Cayley noticed, they observed this in 1856 and posed it as a conjecture, which Sylvester proved 22 years later. And when Sylvester proved it, he said the following, I'm about to demonstrate a theorem which has been waiting proof for the last quarter of a century and upwards. I accomplished with scarcely an effort a task which I had believed lay outside the range of human power. So <laughs> he was uh, very modest about his result. But indeed, what he actually did was he used a, a representation theory where he uh, he, uh, these numbers were dimensions of some representations and it's no, there was not a good intuition or combinatorial proof. And um, basically there, so now there is a combinatorial proof which is um, very much, so it's getting into the details of the representation theoretic proof and making this explicit really. Um, but it's something not so trivial. And uh, what is actually interesting about this problem and why do I mention it is that the difference between two consecutive number of per numbers of partitions is actually a Kronecker coefficient. So we take the Kronecker coefficient for the rectangle, rectangle and a two row partition is exactly this difference. And now of course we from this formula, we immediately have the unimodality because we know that these numbers are positive. The Kronecker coefficients are positive because they're just multiplicities. And so this is positive, but what we could actually do be, thanks to some uh, properties of the Kronecker coefficients was actually get a lower bound for this, uh, for this difference. And um, I will tell you briefly how we did this. And this is really a side problem and more of a curiosity, but it's uh, it's very revealing for the com behavior of chronic care coefficients and how to deal with black boxes when we don't know much. Okay, so the first thing is um, this, uh, this theorem that the Kronecker coefficient for partition and then mu and mu, so the other two partitions are the same and are symmetric. 
So this is these are self-conjugate partition is actually bounded below the by the absolute value of a character of lambda evaluated at these hook lengths. And this uh, this does not follow from uh, just the definition in terms of some inner product of characters or anything like that. This actually required uh, the action of alternating group and studying their, that, those characters. So it's very um, specific somehow as a result. And uh, here is an example where we get that G lambda 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 is always bigger than or equal to one because when we apply this this character and we calculate the character using say Murnagal Nakayama rule, we have that the, there is only one Murnagal Nakayama tableau, so the uh, Murnagal uh, so that the character is just equal to plus minus one, and uh, and the lower bound for the chronic error is one, which in particular means it's positive. And uh, the same, uh, and uh, this uh, this was actually a result observed earlier by Be uh, Christina Bessenroth and Benz um, that uh, this chronic error coefficient is always non-negative. And uh, in particular, so the character of a part, of a partition of a partition when we take uh, the square and uh, the other partition is just a two row is uh, can be actually found explicitly as the number of partitions of n in odd distinct numbers so we get this type of formula and we get various bounds so for example um, we get uh, From this formula that I sh that I showed you earlier, that the chronic error coefficient, uh, there is actually sorry, there is there is a, a small typo, so this should be a two-row partition. Is the difference of this piece, and at the same time, this chronic error coefficient is bigger than the difference of this b, so we actually get an inequality between the uh, consecutive differences of two sequences defined by these generating functions. Okay, but this is this is all a side, uh, a side remark really. In order to prove the lower bound that we did, we actually used the symptotic on this sequence and, uh, and generalize the result due to Almquist that the consecutive differences here, they can be actually analyzed symptotically and found, and found this bound. And for a general chronic error coefficient, so if we have a chronic error coefficient square, square, and then two row, then we can apply this bound directly. And if we have a rectangle, then we use this thing called semi-group property when we can add up partitions partwise and get a bigger chronic error coefficient as long as this chronic error coefficients are actually positive. So we can actually build up positive chronic error coefficients using this semi-group property and get a uh, lot of inequalities. And, uh, and basically then we can apply this asymptotic bound. And so we get our theorem. But at the same time, actually just uh, two years ago, we actually used the uh, probability theory and found tight asymptotics for this uh, for these differences finally which are actually exponential and the, there's the, it's a uh, one more one uh, what change uh, which uh, it's much stronger sharper bound than the one we got but uh, so this is using the interpretation for as uh, as integer partitions, and then of course now we have one of the few asymptotic bounds for some chronic error coefficients as a corollary of this uh, this thing. So, in this case, we see that the chronic error coefficient is exponential, exponential in m, which is about square root of m. 
So this is one special case and a bunch of examples. So as I said, we don't really know that much about these coefficients, but we can get something out of it. Um, now we can continue to use this black box and get some other uh, properties. <clears throat> okay, so, so now we are gonna get to more um, qualitative, uh, uh, more qualitative approach. So, okay, so here we have our little Wood Richardson coefficients and Kronecker coefficients again, in case you have forgotten what these are. And, that, and of course, these definitions don't really tell you anything other than these are non negative integer numbers by being multiplicities. Um, so, what Stanley observed, Richard Stanley observed uh, a while ago, was that if we consider the absolute maximal Kronecker coefficient when we let all the partitions, lambda mu and nu, uh, various partitions of n, then this is of, this would be of the order of square root of n factorial. So n factorial is the order of the group, and this is square root of that order. And also, if we consider the absolute maximal little Wood Richardson coefficient, again, when we let all these partitions vary among everything possible. And this is a completely different picture that this is just exponential. So if you want to think or intuitively square root of n factorial by Stirling's formula is e to the one half n log n, and this is two to the n. So, so this is a uh, this is a completely different order of magnitude, and the Kronikers are much bigger than the little old Richardson. Um, and now, of course, the question is, can we figure out when this is actually happening? So we have an existence theorem, can we make it effective? So can we figure out for what kind of lambda mu and nu we obtain such, uh, such uh, results? Uh, okay. So we don't, of course, <clears throat> without any explicit formula, so for G lambda mu and nu, we can uh, on so far only make uh, various guesses and uh, indirect observations, but we, there is something we can actually say. So, so before I state the results, let me just tell you, uh, another problem with maximizing something. So maximizing the dimension of the reducible representation or F lambda, the number of standard Young tableau of shape lambda. This is actually an old classical problem. And uh, the, second, the, the second order asymptotics here are already unknown. So we know that there are two constants C1 and C2 such that this maximal F lambda is wedged between, but we don't really know that this is really equal to square root n of n factorial times e to the minus some constant square root of n plus lower order terms. So we don't really know this. Uh, however, if, uh, if we have uh, partitions for which the dimension or the number of standard Young tableau is close to, uh, is gonna be close to the maximum, it happens if and only if these partitions are of this shape. So here, this is a, a 45 degree rotation of, uh, of, the, partic of the, the, cur the curve that would describe asymptotically these partitions which achieve close to the maximum dimension. And this is what we call the Verschi Carroll Flocken shape. And uh, we know that if a partition is within that much, then, then, it's the, then the dimension is at least that much. So it's uh, asymptotically square root of n factorial. Okay, so now we use this very uh, deep result. 
And of course, okay, so let me just say that this, this is all possible because we actually have a hook length formula for the dimension F lambda and we can asymptotically analyze it. But this, even that is not so easy when we are in discrete, in the discrete world, we cannot really get this constant so, so well from, from these formulas. Okay, so what happens with the chronic here? So first, so we have various identities we can derive from for chronic air coefficients. For example, we have this one, sum over all lambda mu nu g lambda mu nu squared. This is actually, so this is a sum over this z alpha centralizers. And this is greater than or equal to n factorial. Uh, so in particular, when we maximize over this sum, this, uh, the number of summons is the number of partitions to the third, but the number of partitions as we saw is of much lower order. So we are still dominated by square root of n factorial. And we get that whatever is the maximal thing, uh, entry in this sum is greater than or equal to, uh, to this, and which is of course of order one half n log n minus a half n, and then this uh, error term comes from uh, the number of partitions. And in fact, what we what we can say is that um, if we have chronic air coefficients which is of that order, so which is close to the maximal, then we are forced to have all partition sequences have something closer to the VKLS shape. But we have no way of figuring out which exactly is going to give us the maximal chronic air coefficient. And, uh, and also for, for every two big shapes, so to speak, there is going to be some other one such that this holds, but I mean, the whole thing is not if and only. So it's not true that, it's not necessarily true that if we have three partitions of that uh, that shape, then uh, the chronic air coefficient is going to be that large. We don't even know if it's going to be positive. So this is this is uh, again some type of an existence statement, and uh, here is the proof. Basically, uh, G lambda mu nu is bounded by by the dimensions of any of these representations. So this f lambda f mu and f nu. So if this is going to be large, then these dimensions have to be large and this immediately puts us in the Verschi Carroll Logan shape shape. And at the same time, we also have some other identities which are not so hard to derive. For example, G lambda mu nu summing over all mu and, uh, and times the dimension of the representation mu is just the product of the dimensions of the representations for lambda and mu. And from here again, when we look at the maximum, we get certain lower bounds. Uh, and one can be a little bit more specific using this, uh, this inequalities and say that if the dimension of lambda is going to be, uh, if, if F mu and F nu have um, relatively right, right, uh, large sizes and uh, then there is going to be some other lambda with a large size such that the chronic air coefficient is very large. Um, so here is some more recent results. What happens if, uh, if we are not in this large setting? So let's say that we have partitions lambda mu and nu of bounded number of rows, then we have this type of bound, which in order to parse what this means, let's take an example where we have a long rect rectangle. So the row length is L squared, the height of the length rectangle is L. So L is third cube root of N, then, uh, then the chronic air coefficient when you substitute everything here is less than or equal to four to the N. And this does not follow from what I was just explaining with comparisons to dimension because the dimension here is still pretty large um, and it's of completely different order. 
And how do we prove this? Um, this is uh, this may give us some hint. This about the chronic care coefficients is by by uh, bounds from contingency arrays. So what are contingency arrays? In this case, three dimensional. These are just some tables. Again, in this case, three dimensional tables of uh, integer, non-negative integer, such that the marginals have to be lambda, mu, and nu. So th these are the plane when we take a plane through this uh, three-dimensional cube, so to speak. And uh, we have restrictions of what the sums of the entries in each plane is. And this and these sums are restricted by lambda mu nu. So there is this identity, which is not so hard to prove. These are sure functions, g lambda mu nu times sure function x, times sure function mu y, and sure function of nu z is actually equal when we express it uh, as monomials, is equal to the number of contingency arrays with marginals alpha, beta, and gamma. And, uh, corresponding monomials. So this immediately tells us that the chronic air coefficient, when we just extract coefficients on both sides, at let's say x to the lambda, x to uh, y to the mu and z to the nu is bounded above by this number of contingency uh, arrays. And the thing is the number of 3D contingency tables can be uh, upper bounded in a much tighter way, thanks to a, thanks to a result of Barvinok, which comes from again counting points in polytopes and calculation of volumes in polytopes, because now this is really integer points in polytopes. So basically, there we have a much better handle on things, even though it's still an upper bound, upper bound over maximizing this functional here, which is. We, in some cases, we can do explicitly, like in the case we have here. Um, so how do, what can we say about lower bounds? <laughs> so this is a corollary of the result that I said earlier. If we have a symmetric partition self or self-conjugate partition, then G lambda 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 is at least one. Okay, that's a very, poor lower bound, but what can we say? What can we do? Um, here is something more interesting. So there is this result due to Laurent Manivelle and Ernesto Vallejo independently, that the chronic air coefficient is greater than or equal to the number of pyramids with marginals, which are the conjugates of lambda mu and nu. What is a pyramid? It's a, uh, it's like a young diagram, but in three-dimensional space. So imagine a corner of a room, stack of boxes. And then we are saying that if we take any, let's say XY parallel to XY plane, and we count the number of boxes at, at this section, these are going to be uh, our marginals, lambda prime, mu prime, and nu prime. And uh, and what we can actually estimate, so this it's very hard to get a, actually a pyramid, a proper pyramid, but they uh, we can make some constructions with for, for uh, certain marginals alpha, beta, and gamma, such that the number of pyramids is actually relatively large, although it's still not as exponential as the bounds I was showing earlier. And, uh, and here is the explicit construction. For example, the number of pyramids with these types of marginal, so they are, uh, they are, they are growing quadratically, then uh, G lambda lambda is, we have a, an explicit lower bound, which is almost, so it's exponential in N to the two thirds. 
Uh, but what what we conjecture, and it's, it is related, although it's not it's not obvious why, uh, that uh, when we sum over all these triples of partitions lambda lambda lambda, uh, lambda then just these coefficients alone are, are of, uh, of order um, maximal dimension, or in other words, ex exponential of half n log n, which is square root of n factorial. OK, so I have maybe 10 more minutes. Um, I want to tell you in a more formal way why these problems are actually going to be hard and how we can really prove this uh, formally. And, uh, and the tool here is theor in, from theoretical computer science is computational complexity in particular. So let me define you these classes. So we can in, in, if we have to be formal, this is, these are defined by Turing machines, but for what we really want to, want to think about, these are maybe Boolean circuits or even simpler, any computer program that you write the number of operations that it will do when you run the algorithm, this is really the measure of complexity that we are talking about. So if we have an input I of size N, let's say these are the number of bits, the way we are encoding this in the computer, uh, then there are uh, various problems we may want to solve uh, you, given this input. The first one is decision problem. So basically we're asking a question about this input, which is either yes or no answer, or does there exist an object? For example, does there exist a Hamiltonian cycle in a graph? So the graph is our input, maybe it's given by the JSON matrix. And then we are asking, does this have a Hamiltonian cycle, write a program, a computer program that decides this and what's the fastest possible computer program that you can write. Uh, so there are classes of problems. The class P is the one when the, ye the yes, no answer uh, is uh, in time uh, O to the N, N to the D. And um, <clears throat> so some polynomial for some fixed D. And there is the class NP where we cannot solve the problem fast, but if the answer is yes, if there is such an object, if there is a Hamiltonian cycle, then we can check whether it really is a Hamiltonian cycle or whatever object it is in polynomial time. Uh, and, uh, and basically these classes are characterized by their complete problem. So everything in NP is equivalent, polynomially equivalent to one of these NP complete problems. Or tree, tree colorability, the tree satisfiability, Hamiltonian cycle, knapsack, and so on. So there is a big uh, universe of NP complete problems. And of course, they're all polynomially equivalent to each other under polynomial reduction. And then there are the counting problems where we, we are given the input, we want to compute some integer valued function on the input. So for example, we the input might be three partitions and we want to find what the Kronecker coefficient is. This would be a valid problem in this class. And here the equivalent classes are FP for the polynomial time and sharp P where the number of objects that we are counting when, when the sharp P is just counting some objects which are the solution to this NP problem. But inherently it's a positive exponential for positive exponential sum over polynomially computable uh, entries, positive, positive entries, I must say. 
Of course, the, the big problem is, is P equal to NP. Well, I don't know. <laughs> We're not going to answer this now, but uh, this, is, this is the type of uh, questions that, that, of course, people would want to know. Um, Sorry, Greta, can I ask a quick yeah. question about that? Sure. So I, I have always thought that hash P means things are extremely hard computationally, but somehow- Sharp P, yeah. Uh, yeah, sharp P is like, uh, you seem to say that sharp P is more like NP in the sense yeah. can verify. Is that right? I mean, I'm not sure I understand what exactly you mean by uh, number of objects in CI for an NP problem. Uh, could you explain that again? Uh, okay, so, so suppose maybe I give you an example. So an NP hard problem is to decide whether a graph has Hamiltonian cycle. Yeah. And a sharp P problem would be to count the number of Hamiltonian cycles in a graph. So what makes it sharp P is the fact that the yes, no problem is NP. It, yeah, exactly. So that you cannot really list this, this uh, objects that you're counting over in polynomial time. Ah, so yeah, okay. So it is right. So the hard, uh, this uh, sharp P problems yeah. are hard. Yes, sharp P problems are the hard ones, NP problems are the hard ones. And of course, there are even harder problems, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. we don't want to step there. <laughs> yeah. Right. So sharp P is really the counting analog of NP when NP is just the answer is yes or no, and sharp P is how many. But it's, uh, it's yeah, yeah thank it's, you. Dif it's difficult to, to get the answer informally speaking. And uh, okay, so we can, uh, okay, let's start with the easy problem. So as I said, so the dimension of a irreducible representation is the number of standard Young tableau, which is the hook length formula, which I've written here explicitly, and it's just a product. So the product we can calculate in polynomial time and that's easy. So this problem is going to be in P. Now let's move to something else that you hopefully you're familiar with. These are the Koska numbers, the number of semi-standard Young tableau of shape lambda and content mu. There is no more a formula for them in general, uh, but they are, so we are summing over this nice combinatorial objects, right? this semi-standard semi, this semi -standard Young tableau. So now this is, uh, and if we, in order to decide whether the cost coefficient is positive, all we need to check is whether the one per, the shape is dominating the content that we are filling in with this tableau. So these are some linear inequalities, which we verify very quickly, basically in linear time, not even polynomial. So this is going to be checking whether uh, there is one such semi-standard Young tableau is in P. But now here is the thing that basically <clears throat> counterintuitive to what we were discussing earlier with Hamiltonian cycles. So deciding whether there is one such semi-standard Young tableau is easy. Counting how many we have is still hard. So if we want to give an input lambda and mu in in binary, unary, whatever, whichever size you want, you want to know how many semi-standard Young tableau we have. Uh, it is actually strongly sharp P complete, which is uh, a recent, recent result. So basically it's exponentially hard in N to actually figure out and list all of this semi-standard Young tableau in some way. So, or in a compact way. Um, so then we can ask, now following up the question about positivity of little Wood Richardson coefficient, deciding positivity is, in, 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 is polynomial because it's basically solving a feasibility problem. There's a, a linearly defined polytope have a point, and, uh, 
have any points, and it turns out it's going to be an integer who is going to correspond to a little Wood Richardson tableau. So this is a breakthrough result of the Alan Knudsen and Terry Tao from 20 years ago. Um, but it turns out that to compute the little Wood Richardson coefficient is still strongly sharp p hard. So figuring out if there is one such object is easy, but counting how many there are is hard. And now we can go back, go to our uh, towards Kronecker. So first we can ask about characters of the symmetry group. So as we saw, they are also a lower bound for the Kronecker coefficient sometimes. So one might hope for something. We can ask whether the character is zero or not, or its absolute value is positive, strictly positive or not. And we can actually compute it, at least the absolute value in this case. Um, and it turns out, again, these are both, both these problems are provably hard and are strongly, meaning that if the input is in unary, or I just list your per, the partition one, 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 so not, not bit encoding, but every, uh, but just the, the, the entire number of, let's say, sum of ones. Uh, this is going to be NP hard and sharp P hard. And uh, of course, and then the Kronecker coefficients are, of course, some much worse than anything else. <laughs> Uh, so they are um, deciding whether the Kronecker is positive is NP hard. This is a relatively recent result of Christian Nickenmeyer, uh, Ketan Molmuli, and uh, Michael Walter. And uh, to compute the Kronecker coefficient, this is something in what's called gap P. It's gap P is the class of functions which are differences of two positive integer functions, which are themselves in sharp P. But basically we don't know how to do the cancellations. And when we have a negative signs, we are no, not really in sharp P anymore. Uh, and, uh, and the big conjecture of course, is to comp that to compute the Kronecker is in sharp, is actually in sharp P since well, it's in gap P, it's in its uh, non-negative integer. One could expect that it's in sharp P, but this is actually also going to be equivalent in some sense to finding a combinatorial interpretation. And uh, <clears throat> I say, sorry, so how long was this supposed to be? I don't want to go over time too much. Yeah, it's uh, it's you. You have certainly another five minutes, but don't worry too much. It's okay to go over time a little. Bit. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess uh, the benefits of being at home. <laughs> um, okay, so I can tell you in two or three more minutes another sort of uh, result, which is telling us that you know we cannot really hope things are gonna be that nice. Um, so <clears throat> let me get to something more specific. So the chronic care coefficients um, have this nice stability property. So basically, if you let the first row of a partition of the three partitions grow, eventually these numbers will stabilize. So they will they will become equal to each other, and uh, and this. So this is this is what I mean by letting the first row is n minus alpha, and then we have some other parts. This is if this is growing, uh, eventually there is going to be a stable limit, and this is what's called the reduced Kronecker coefficient. It's the limit of these objects, and uh, and as we uh, mentioned earlier, the, this reduced Kronecker coefficient is coincides with the little Wood Richardson coefficients in the case when the sizes of the partitions beta and gamma add up to lambda or to alpha. 
Okay, so so Littlewood Richardson coefficients by what I mentioned earlier, Knudsen and Tao's result, they satisfy what's called the saturation property. Basically, if you multiply all parts, alpha, beta, and gamma, if you multiply their parts by an integer, and this turns out to be positive, then the original Little Richardson coefficient was also positive and vice versa. Uh, and uh, yeah, I had a question about uh, who uh, to who is this result attributed? Uh, the fact that reduced Kronecker is Little Wood Richardson. Oh, this is this is already due to Murnagam from yeah from more than half Thank a century you. ago. Yeah. So this is this is a classical result. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So little would Richardson satisfy the saturation property. If you scale, if you scale the partitions, their sizes. Uh, if the original thing was positive, you're getting again a positive thing, and but you can go backwards as well. And. Uh, and now again, everything here is motivated about the Kronecker coefficient is motivated from the behavior with the little Richardson. So Anatol Kirillov and uh, and Kliatchko, uh, made this conjecture that the reduced Kronecker coefficients satisfy the saturation property just like the little Richardson. So basically, if there is some n for which these rescaled partitions give you a positive reduced Kronecker coefficient, then the original Kronecker coefficient would be positive. So unfortunately, even for the reduced Kronecker coefficients, they were believed to be nicer for a long time. Unfortunately, they are not. So. Um, here is this proof of this conjecture. Of course, a disproof of a conjecture takes just a particular example of alpha, beta, and gamma, and, and this would, uh, that for which this doesn't hold, but uh, we can also find a more general class of uh, triples of partitions for, for which these reduced Kronecker coefficients become positive when you rescale for subfibs by sufficiently large n, but the original Kronecker coefficient, reduced Kronecker coefficient is zero. And of course, here is a very specific example, which we just compute. If uh, this is alpha and gamma, then the reduced Kronecker coefficient is just zero. And we just scale it by two, take a reduced Kronecker coefficient is gonna be positive. It's 18, I think, actually. And uh, in order to prove this, we use some, again, black box type of properties for Kronecker coefficients. For example, we know that uh, if we have a positive Kronecker coefficient, then we have some inequalities between the diagonals or the Durfee square size of the partition. So this cannot be a very thick partition if the other two are very narrow. Um, and then we use this result, which we use for geometric complexity theory to show that the reduced Kronecker coefficient, which is bounded by an actual Kronecker coefficient for rectangles in this case, this is always positive for almost all gamma that we can think of. And this gives us a larger family of counter, of counter examples. And, uh, and we can ask the same question about bound. So the reduced Kronecker coefficient, when we do all, all the maximal ones, it has the same behavior as the, the Kronecker coefficients themselves, which is due, due to this nice formula that the reduced Kronecker can be expressed as the sum over uh, Kronecker original Kronecker coefficients modified by this multi little Richardson, which are not so big from from what we already know. So the basically the dominance will come from a Kronecker coefficient somewhere here. And of course, there is a lower bound. 
So we get we get uh, lower and upper bound on the order of square root of n factorial. So this is what it should be. And uh, and again, the same question complexity for the reduced Kronecker coefficients is uh, basically the same hopeless situation. Uh, compute to compute the Kronecker coefficient is strongly Sharpie hard, which comes from this formula where we can now express the Kronecker coefficient as assigned sum of reduced Kronecker coefficients. And basically the logic here is that if these were easy to compute, these reduced Kronecker coefficients were easy to compute from this formula, immediately the Kronecker would be easy to compute, which is not the case. So, so this is, uh, uh, to compute the reduced, actually, to compute the reduced Kronecker reduces <laughs> to computing Kronecker as well, or the other way around. So, so this is also Sharpie hard. And thank you very much for <laughs> surviving this talk. <laughs> uh, thank you, Greta. Let's all uh, unmute our mics and. So I'm sure there are uh, some questions. Uh, just please feel free to unmute your mic and ask. Okay, so uh, I have a few questions. Um, so uh, one thing I was wondering is, uh, do you think there exists a convex uh, polyhedron whose lattice points count chronicler uh, uh, or reduced chronicler coefficient? Um, so this might be the case. So the fact that uh, they are Sharpie hard to compute doesn't exclude this because uh, it may be a not so nice uh, polyhedron. So uh, we, we so far we cannot rule this out, but I personally doubt it. <laughs> okay, it could be that the polyhedron is very difficult to describe. Yeah, so yeah, so so there are such objects so we like just from complexity standpoint we cannot really disprove such a statement uh, and uh, the, the reason i wonder is because you had this uh, approach using contingency tables um, and there it looks like these uh, uh, there may be some collection of contingency tables which would count uh, chronic coefficients that's a, that's a very good point. And in fact, one formula which I didn't really show is that we can express a Kronecker coefficient as a signed sum over contingency table. So we have some minus sum over some of the contingency tables minus another sum over certain contingency tables. And this is what what is a gap P formula but we have no way of doing the cancellation. So of course we know that the difference is gonna be no negative, but we somehow have to remove this, these points from each other, or I guess take, take a difference between, between two polyhedrons. Uh, it's not clear whether we can, we will be able to get the polyhedron and so far we have been successful. Uh, can I ask a question, Amri, before you yeah, ask sure, your next sure. related to yours? So, uh, uh, given that saturation doesn't hold, if uh, even if there are these polyhedra, they don't scale. Nearly, that's what it means, right? So exactly. Yes. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Yeah. So you, we don't. I mean, and and this is this is what we what we would expect because this the decision problem is already np hard so of course given assuming that p is not equal to np then we we will not uh, expect a nice nice polyhedron but... um also i was intrigued uh, in the result of moneyvale and uh, vallejo 
there is a, a lambda prime, a new prime, a new prime. So is that uh, because you are trying to look at the multiplicity of the sign representation of the tensor product? Or, uh, yes. Yeah. So roughly speaking, that's uh, it's it's done with with representation theory and counting highest weights. So I guess maybe sure. I, probably goes through the sure vile duality here but uh, yeah so there's uh, i mean the chronicle coefficient can be seen as the multiplicity of the trivial representation in the triple tensor but you can yeah. also for the multiplicity of the sign representation in the trivial in the triple tensor uh yes. that, uh, but <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, maybe uh, are these problems somehow uh, equivalent? Uh, or do we expect the one to be easier? Or um, so okay. So so actually, uh, to count the number of pyramids, so the same result, it turns out that this already is. A sharp p hard problem, or even to decide that a, such a pyramid exists. Okay. So this is actually how we can Meyerman Mule Walter proved it. So even though it looks it looks much nicer, hmm. uh, it turns out that this counting these pyramids is already, or even deciding that that such a pyramid would exist is already a hard problem. <laughs> But you have a formula there, uh, exponential. What is the uh, theta there? Theta is uh, um, saying it's the same a, order, is it? Yeah. It's the same order, yes. Yeah. But that doesn't imply, a, that gives some sort of lower bound, I suppose. Yeah, yeah so this gives a lower bound in this in this specific case, but uh, but it doesn't tell us exactly how many there, there are. and. I mean, of course, when we have you have some very specific partitions, it might be easy to find the formula for this specific partition, but that doesn't because mean that the general question that exists. exists for some alpha, beta, gamma. Yeah. 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 Okay, I see. So that's still very hard. Okay, thanks. Um, does anybody else have other questions? Can I ask a question about uh, little root Richardson rule? Please. Does one know when uh, the coefficients are maximum, meaning given lambda and mu? Uh, can one uh, say for which mu it is maximum and how much is the maximum? Uh, no. So again, so we can all we can say is we can have some type of existence. So there is going to be some mu and mu which is of certain shape or dimension close to some to the maximal so it's all it's always the this maximal shape the Verschi Carroll Logan shape shape but uh, we cannot we cannot sol solve it explicitly there is no so far no no approach where we can find given 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 the two partitions find the other one so, but Explain. even if the first two partitions are not of this uh, uh, special shape, do we know that the third one, I mean, then it may not be that the third one needs to be of this. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so then that that question is actually unclear in general. So if you have some, some specific mu and mu, what is the maximal yeah. lambda, we don't really, yeah, that, that one we cannot solve. But also what is the size of the maximal? Does one know uh, what is? Yeah, so we so so the the best thing one can say, given given some mu and nu, is uh, using this Barvinok uh, bounds for integer points in polytopes. One can hope to use that and get some kind of an upper bound. But uh, you know, this this problems already become become difficult from. Not computational complexity, but just computational is just to figure out what this maximum are when we have mu and specific partitions.
Okay. Um, so, any any more questions? Uh, can I just ask, uh, uh, yeah. Deependra? Uh, could you? Uh, so you are fixing lambda and mu, and you are wanting to find the largest uh, 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 possible C lambda mu nu. Yeah. Mu such that. In the little root Richardson rule, I yeah. was asking if one new lambda and mu, for instance, lambda could be equal to mu, and then uh, I'm asking. Find mu such that C lambda mu nu is maximum. Is that is maximum. Yeah. So the, there are two questions, related questions. What is the maximum and where is it achieved? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So this is in. For for some specific lambda mu and nu that you want, this is it's hard to, to answer. So all we know is there are some existence type of you know there is going to be something. So when 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 lambda mu and nu are close to the Blanchard shape, then then maybe we can find the third one where where the maximum is achieved of certain order, but nothing specific. Sorry, but uh, isn't the size of the third one determined? So if you know mu and nu, then the size of lambda is the size of mu. Yeah, yeah, but we don't, I mean, we, the size of the little Richardson coefficient. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah at least maybe some bounds in terms of mu and nu could be. It's, uh, I mean, of course, there are various trivial bounds that would come from, yeah. from, dimension type of formulas um, but um, but even a, lo a lower bound is already hard because if we deviate a little bit let's say that we make one partition have a very long first column so macroscopically we wouldn't really see this on the limit shape but microscopically, this would violate the little Wood Richardson rule, and this would give us a zero little Wood Richardson coefficient. So you have things like that that are happening, and um, and I mean, it's with these problems, it's possible that you change the partitions just by a little bit, and then somehow the coefficient changes by orders of magnitude already because of the discrete nature of this. Okay, um, any more questions? I mean, maybe I will just ask one more question. You said that because of the discreteness, but you know, the partition function is supposed to be quite a smooth object. That's uh, yeah. That's that's true. So if we just counting the the number of partitions, yes. But with the little Wood Richardson coefficient, then the the rules become more and more complicated. So, so little Wood Richardson rules are not as smooth as partition functions. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, instead of the, looking at the problem for GLN, uh, if one looked at the problem with uh, so to say trivial central character which means that uh, 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 perhaps in this language, uh, summation of lambda i is divisible by n. Uh, does it simplify the analysis? I'm not sure. <laughs> OK. No, I mean, uh, 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 summation of lambda i being divisible by n or its congruence modulo n plays some role. I mean, uh, in, the, in the little old Richardson rule, only things which are uh, of a certain congruence figure in. Mm -hmm. yeah, Amri, I mean, if the representations have a, central, a certain central character, then in the tensor product, the central character is dictated to you. So only certain congruences happen. Mm -hmm. So one way to take care of this problem is that instead of looking at GLN, one should always look at the problem for PGLN, which means that the summation of lambda i is divisible by n. And uh, 
uh, that is true for lambda, for mu, and for nu. And uh, then I think the question would be whether the, the numbers are smooth. And perhaps uh, maybe what you are saying is that they are uh, they don't have the smoothness property of the Ramanujan partition function. Yeah, they 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 don't. But uh, again, there there certainly are, as you say, numbers some number theoretic. There are yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think one needs to take care of that. But maybe even then, it is not smooth. Uh, yeah. I I wouldn't bet my money on <laughs> on it being smooth. <laughs> so. Uh-huh. But maybe there is some uh, uh, degree of smoothness. I mean, after all, partition function yeah. is a discrete object, so it is uh, not as smooth as a continuous function, but it is, uh, we all know that it has a very smooth behavior. Exactly. So basically, the way you would measure degrees of smoothness is how many orders of magnitude can you approximate, basically. Yeah. And it's already, it's already with the maximal dimension of the symmetric group, this F1, the we already see this problem there because you know we know the leading term square root of n factorial and then the next one should be e to some constant square root of n but we don't know that such a constant exists so so we only know that it is moving between between these values but you know as a function of n it might be oscillating uh, and might there might be some number theoretic phenomenon happening of how exactly you can shape the the partition with given n um, so so my guess is that with little wood richardson of course things would be even worse so All right. Thank you. so i just checked uh, uh, what dipendra asked uh, i checked the maximum of uh, uh, little word Richardson at uh, lambda mu mu, uh, so mu equals new, uh, and uh, uh, the sequence is not in the OEIS. So. <laughs> Sorry, what is the answer, Arvind? So the sequence it doesn't seem to be a known sequence. So uh, no. numbers yeah. are, it seems to be. No, no, but I think the question is whether the numbers are smooth or they are not smooth. I mean, I don't know. I can send you the first 15 uh, numbers. <laughs> yeah. But they don't seem to be. It's not a question of first 15. You have to generate a million or a trillion <laughs> number and then see whether, you know, it looks like a good smooth object. No, no, I know. I'm just saying that it doesn't seem to be known. It doesn't seem to be a, a sequence known in the literature. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Because it's not in the online encyclopedia. But uh, Arvin, is the question clear? Yeah, 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 I understand. Yeah, yeah. you're talking um, about something more refined. I, I just said that I just wanted to check if uh, these sequences are known or not, and it doesn't seem to be. And that's all I said. Yeah. Okay. okay. And it's certainly hard to compute uh, beyond a certain number because we are looking at a maximum, so we have to run over all partitions. But do we know how? Uh, I think we know how fast it grows, right? I mean. Yeah. yeah. So that's that uh, data know. mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's all we know. Okay. okay, so I suppose uh, any more questions? Uh, no? Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank uh, uh, Greta again for this uh, really nice talk and for also coming late in the evening. <laughs> thank you very much for listening. <laughs> yeah. Yes, beautiful.